I'm Lisa Saunders with an Ask the Expert on PACB TV, Baldwinsville Public Access Channel. And today I have a very important topic on hand washing, given what's going on today with coronavirus. Hand washing is not as simple as it sounds, so I've invited Nellie Brown, a certified industrial hygienist, Director of Workplace Health and Safety Programs. Hi, Nellie. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> Good. Thanks for joining me from your home. I'm in my home. Um, Nellie, can you tell us what you do exactly and who you're with before we launch into hand washing, the when and how and why? Well, um, I'm a certified industrial hygienist. I direct the Workplace Health and Safety Program, which is part of the Worker Institute uh, at uh, Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Uh, and what I do is I provide uh, training, uh, technical assistance, um, uh, site investigations and so forth uh, in uh, the field of occupational safety and health. So I deal with a wide range of uh, possibilities, um, people working with chemicals, of course, biological agents like we're going to be talking about today, um, and ergonomics and uh, crisis and violence and homicide and all kinds of nasty stuff, uh, and um, indoor air quality and um, uh, just about anything people do at work really uh, so that they can do it safely. Gosh, I'd like to, uh, when we're done with this interview, I'd actually like to have you come back on to discuss some of the other things you you talk about because I've heard you before and you have a wealth of information. I've even eaten dinner with you and you told me what to watch out for with, with, with waitresses and I walked into the bathroom and saw our waitress didn't wash her hands. So I almost <laughs> had a heart attack, but maybe she didn't go, you know. <laughs> but anyway, you've made me see things in a new light when I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm out in public. So anyway, Nellie, I know you have um, a little bit of a presentation. I'd love for you to share it. Okay. Well, uh, let me do that. And um, okay. So um, all righty. Well, um, when we talk about, for example, the current pandemic, but really <laughs> so many diseases that could be spread through, um, through uh, uh, airborne droplets like influenza and colds and so on, uh, you have to realize that um, when people cough and sneeze, uh, they shed a lot of droplets uh, into the air and, and with some force. And uh, these droplets can travel quite a distance. Um, the uh, current information suggests that um, these droplets typically can travel as much as six feet before they drop. Uh, and that means that um, when we do cough and sneeze, our preference, of course, uh, is to use a tissue, throw it away, and then wash our hands afterwards. And if we can't get to a tissue fast enough, uh, to, of course, put our arm in front of our uh, faces and um, uh, do the Dracula pose uh, so that the sneeze is caught uh, on uh, our uh, clothes. But um, of course, that's uh, not always uh, possible. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, <laughs> when we think about that, you know, uh, we certainly uh, have a lot of potentially uh, contaminated surfaces, a lot of germy things out there as a result of that. And I always remind people, you know, today we were so focused on coronavirus, which is principally an airborne disease, but it can also be spread through people touching uh, surfaces that have been contaminated and then touching their, you know, rubbing their eyes, touching their nose or mouth uh, without washing their hands first. But that's, of course, only, uh, only looking at one disease. We spread a lot of diseases through commonly touched objects, including uh, a lot of our gastrointestinal illnesses that give us, uh, you know, diarrhea and so on. So um, this is really something that is uh, more universally applicable when you think about paying attention to contaminated surfaces and how we wash our hands. So I've given some examples here because a lot of times when I have people in workshops, I will say to you, okay, when you left your house today, uh, on your way to the time you got into my training program, what did you touch? Uh, and then people think about that and realize, oh my goodness, you know, I, I put gas in my car, I stopped at the ATM and got some money out. Um, you know, oh yeah, on the way in, I stopped in the break room and I, uh, I got to, I got coffee and uh, you know, before you know it, people uh, have no idea, you know, they use the elevator, they use the, they use the, they used, um, the rails in the stairway, they, they've touched so many things. And a lot of these, of course, we can disinfect, which means that uh, you know, now we're, we're saying essential workers include custodians and janitors and so forth. 
because they're going around cleaning and taking care of commonly touched things. But you also have to think of the things we can't disinfect, you know, like our magazines and our newspapers and our books and, you know, things that you really don't, you know, can't disinfect really. Um, and so these, this attention to touching things becomes important. Um, and, uh, you know, when uh, you think about uh, this issue with coronavirus, you know, we don't have a lot of work uh, on this uh, right now, but what we do have suggests that on some surfaces, the virus dies quickly, on others, it survives for a long time. But I always like to point out to people, if you look at these die-off curves, the vertical axis there is powers of 10, which means that these viruses are dying off actually fairly rapidly. And even though you can still, with sophisticated techniques, detect some virus on some surfaces a while later, there's not a lot there. It's the fresh stuff that's our worry, and that's when the viruses are going to be at their highest levels. Keep in mind, a virus, of course, can't reproduce itself uh, on a surface. Uh, it doesn't have the equipment to do that. It only uses a little bit of genetic material surrounded by a protein coat. So it'll either survive or die, but it won't increase in numbers. It has to invade uh, living cells, infect us, and make our cells reproduce the virus for it. Uh, so this issue of you know, touching things that are in common use, where the uh, droplets that have landed on them will be fresh, that's when the virus is going to be at its highest concentrations. And that's why we say to people, frequent hand washing makes a big difference. <clears throat> and that, again, of course, says to us what types of attention do we pay? to cleaning and decontaminating our surfaces. And uh, you know, virus survival depends a lot on what the surface is, on the temperature and the humidity, the presence of sunlight, and so many factors. And um, you know, even when you think about influenza, it can survive on things like books and doorknobs for hours uh, later. And uh, so again, hand washing becomes so important. And uh, if we do have surfaces that are disinfectable, we want to, of course, use germicides that are approved by the EPA uh, for the target organism. Uh, and uh, the EPA has a list on its website of those, and you can look it up, for example, uh, on the list I'm showing highlighted here is for coronavirus. But all you have to do is go to their website and uh, put in the organism you want to kill, and it'll give you a list of what, to, to, of what um, products you can use, uh, along with directions uh, on the label of the product that tell you once you've applied it to the surface, what is its dwell time? How long does it sit there to do the kill the manufacturer says it can do? Now, of course, um, you can use bleach. Uh, on CDC's website, they'll say, to you, oh, here's how you dilute bleach. And I've given some examples here of how you can dilute bleach. But you know, bleach is pretty hard on many surfaces. And oftentimes, people will, you know, would not want to apply bleach to meant so many things. And so the EPA list does have a lot of products that also have um, alternatives to, um, uh, to bleach or sodium hypochlorite, and you can use things that won't be as damaging. Uh, and I remind people, you know, during the current pandemic, people may be doing a lot of cleaning more intensely than they never thought about it before. You know, you might be switching to some newer, stronger products, uh, or using them more frequently or heavier use than you ever had done before. So, you know, be aware that the people using the products may find uh, themselves getting symptoms of overexposure. Uh, building occupants may notice this more, uh, may even get symptoms uh, from that uh, or adverse effects um, that, such as um, uh, uh, aggravating someone's asthma or uh, a surface beginning to show some damage from the product being chosen. And we need to be alert to these things to make sure we're protecting people adequately uh, from the products that we are using. Now, um, I don't know about you, but I always like to ask people about, uh, about what they think about habits of hand washing. So I like to get people to reflect on this. You know, so many illnesses can be prevented if we do have good hand washing habits. So what is it that you think that we do um, when we have uh, situations like the current pandemic? Are you well, asking me? <laughs> yes. And I'm washing my hands all the time and I'm actually getting, they're very getting raw and cracked. And even though, even so, I still know I'm not washing them enough, really. But well, anyway. you know, we do have to pay attention to our skin with that. Um, and I do remind people, you know, uh, you want a good ha uh, hand lotion, take care of your skin. Uh, if uh, it's possible to uh, wear gloves, whatever it is you were doing, 
then try to do that. Um, you know, if your hands are dirty, you really do need to wash them. Uh, but if they're not so dirty, you're just concerned about what you touched, uh, you could certainly use hand gel as an alternative. Uh, it, it's just hand washing is always preferred. So we do need to be careful about that. But so much of the time, you know, we're not washing thoroughly or long enough when we yes, do it. And so we think we're getting the benefit of it and we're not. And I always like to reflect back, you know, when we have studied this issue, you know, the things that came out after uh, the, the influenza pandemic we had years ago with H1N1, uh, you know, the results of that are not very happy. Uh, I mean, 54%, uh, over half of people said they didn't wash their hands more frequently during the pandemic uh, uh, than they had before. Uh, and uh, in one uh, swab test, after using the bathroom, 28% of those people still had fecal bacteria in their hands. And you wonder oh. why I say we spread gastrointestinal illnesses, you know, by commonly touched things. People don't always do a good job washing their hands. And there's the proof of that. And then, you know, uh, during that uh, H1N1 pandemic, you know, people were asked, did you wash your hands more than 10 times in the day? And as you can see, 62% of women said yes, but only 37% of men did. And so much of the time we don't wash long enough. So we're gonna talk about that technique uh, in, a, in just a moment. And of course, I always like people to pay attention to what they do uh, after they've soaked and rinsed their hands so they don't recontaminate themselves. And I wanna make a few comments about that because it's Thank a favorite you. soapbox of mine, truthfully. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As I've talked awesome. about before, Lisa, so you, you know, I always like to, to say, oh my goodness, look at how the restroom is designed. Um, so um, when we say to people, wash your hands with soap, preferably warm water, but if you prefer cool water, that's fine. Uh, but do it for 15 to 20 seconds. What do you do next? Uh, so um, here's our first choice. Do you turn off the faucet, then uh, dry your hands? Uh, do you use disposable towel to turn off the faucet and then use the towel to dry your hands? Or did you dry your hands with a disposable towel and then use the towel to turn off the faucet? So here, here you are, you know, say in a public restroom, what are, you, what are you doing? I'm hoping you're doing the last one. But of course, sometimes that is not an option. So let's look at what's good technique and then see what we might find uh, that we have to really think about to make sure we don't defeat the good technique we've been trying. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm <clears throat> getting a little dry here. So we wanna wet our hands with clean running water, turn off the tap and apply soap. Now, of course, in the drawing being shown there, the faucet is automatic. So yes, we can move our hands away so that the water stops so that we can indeed soak them up and lather the hands really well uh, and not get them rinsed off too quickly because the water's still running. We wanna make sure that we've covered all of our hand surfaces, the backs of the hands between the fingers, you know, in the finger webs and under our nails. Does that mean, uh, are you a believer in keeping nails short? <laughs> well, personally, that is always my, my preference, but um, I don't like to get too much into people's personal habits, but you know, the, the issue with um, long fingernails is that contamination can be underneath of, of, of fingernails, and in which case, you know, you might want to consider using a, a little brush uh, for that. Um, now, scrubbing your hands for the, a long enough time to do a truly thorough job of it. And if you want to time yourself, you can, of course, think of the happy birthday song and go through it twice. Uh, or if you prefer, do twinkle, twinkle, little star. And, um, you know, your, your choice of how you want to do it. But that gives you a chance to, to give you a, a true good idea of whether you have been washing truly long and thoroughly enough. Then you want to be able to rinse your hands and then my view is, of course, ideally would be that you've got this automatic faucet as you see in the picture. And so you can simply go dry your hands uh, on a, a clean paper towel or uh, air dry them uh, if that's uh, the only option available. But um, my question is always, well, all right, let's say you have faucets that you turn on manually. If they're a lever style faucet, after you've washed your hands, you can probably turn that le those levers off with your elbow uh, in some way and, uh, uh, and then go get your paper towel or air dry your hands. But what if the faucets aren't as easy to work with as that? What if they really need to be manipulated by your hands? Well, wait a minute. <laughs> you turn those faucets on with your contaminated hands. You really don't wanna have to touch them again. So leave the water running, you know, 
go get the paper towel, dry your hands, and then use the paper towel to turn off the faucet. Okay, well, I've run into restrooms which unfortunately aren't designed like that. Sometimes the faucet is automatic, uh, but a lot of times it's manual. But now I have a blow dryer. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now what am I going to do? And I found myself elbowing my way back into the toilet stall, getting some toilet paper and going back and turning off the faucets with the toilet paper because I had nothing else to work with. Um, and then I've been in restrooms where it's a push on faucet and you're trying to go through happy birthday or twinkle twinkle a couple times, but the water just peters out. So whenever I have pushed on faucets, I will soap up my hands and then I soap up the little handle on the faucet and I, oh my gosh, I rinse off the faucet handle and I come back, you know, and uh, so I can turn, you know, so I know if I run out of water, I can turn the faucet back on because at least I cleaned it a little bit. I mean, I'm going through all these gyrations to try to make this work. I would love to and, have um, you in, a, in each style of bathroom. Can we ever do that someday when social distancing <laughs> is over? <laughs> Oh boy, you know, I, I, and this is not the first time I've talked to people about this idea of how our bathrooms design because, you know, I, I, while I am certainly, um, uh, you know, uh, very well understanding of the idea of water conservation uh, and not having faucets one, running endlessly, uh, I realize that, but this is a public health issue. And I think we have to pay attention to the public health aspects of that. <clears throat> Okay, so those are some of my uh, fundamental pet well, peeves as well. <laughs> well, that was kind of perfect timing. Uh, you, you covered it. And like I said, I, every time I go to a public bathroom now, I'm in such distress because I try to remember what you've told me. <laughs> That's why I'd love a fun film of you going through these antics you have to go through to wash and dry. <laughs> well, you know, the worst uh, experience I think I've had, um, I was in a very, very old uh, school building, and uh, the restrooms were very old-fashioned, and there were separate uh, handles and faucets for both the hot water and the cold water. So if you started out thinking, well, I'll, start, I'll wash my hands with the hot water faucet, but the water got so hot I couldn't take it anymore. And so then you'd go over and you say, well, okay, I'll try to soap up the handle and turn on the cold water faucet. And the water there was so cold uh, that my hands were getting stiff. And so you were just faced with the disaster of, of what in the world do I do now? And you know, you just try to make the best you can of a bad situation sometimes. Well, Nellie, thank you so much for coming on my uh, on the show here, and we're all going to really appreciate what you're doing, and please come back for another interview. I would love to talk about all the different things we face, all the germs we face every day. It's such a war, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Us against them, for sure. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I, I hope to see you soon. Okay. Take right. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.